AOE. Um, maybe I'll just give one more minute. I know we don't have many participants yet, so um, I'll just wait one more minute here while we're getting set up. Um, maybe Leah, could you just give me a thumbs up if you can see my screen? Awesome. Okay. And I'll just arrange my screen here. Perfect. Okay. Well, it's nine o'clock, so why don't I get started anyways? Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, welcome to Watershed Management in a Changing Climate session. So my name is Caitlin Chandler, and I'm with the City of Calgary's Climate Change Program. And I'm going to be moderating this session. And uh, this session features two other co-presenters, Laura Pacola from Inside Education. She's just given a wave there. And Kyle White from the City of Calgary's Water Resources team. And we're also joined by Leah Harding, who is with the Alberta Council for Environmental Education. She's just kind of making sure everything runs smoothly for us here. Um, so please note that throughout the presentation, we're going to be sharing a lot of useful resources that you can use with your students. And if you're interested in getting a copy of the presentation, including links to the resources, we'll show you how to contact us at the end of the presentation. So we'll actually send you, you know, the slides with the links and, and uh, resources and that sort of thing. So um, I'll just skip to the next slide here. So, so you know, this workshop is part of a symposium titled Hand in Hand, Working Together Toward a Sustainable Calgary. And this symposium represents a collaboration between the Alberta Council for Environmental Education, uh, the City of Calgary, and our environmental education community. So this symposium consists of 12 sessions that cover a range of topics, including the Eco Schools Certification Program, which is now available in Calgary, uh, biodiversity, water management, waste management, climate change, and Indigenous perspectives. So all sessions feature multiple speakers, including seasoned environmental educators and City of Calgary experts. And to better meet your teaching needs, the sessions are divided into an elementary and a secondary stream. So this workshop specifically is designed for secondary teachers. Um, if you are teaching younger students, you're certainly welcome to keep viewing, but you might want to check out our parallel workshop designed specifically for elementary teachers, um, which is called Where Land and Water Meet, and it's happening at 1045 today. So, um, so everybody is aware, all sessions are being recorded and will be made available through the ACE website. Um, I guess I'll just pause here to do a quick note about um, Zoom etiquette. I'm sure we're all well aware of this by now, but um, it'll be really helpful if you can just keep yourself on mute while the presenters are presenting. Um, but um, in terms of questions, feel free to ask questions in the chat throughout the entire time, um, th throughout the entire session at any time, and we'll respond when we can. But we're also going to pause for five minutes after each presentation for a uh, for a a Q and A session. Um, yeah, go to the next slide here. So, for those of you who haven't heard about the Alberta Council for Environmental Education, they're a small nonprofit organization whose mission is to advance environmental education in Alberta's K to 12 schools. And their vision is that Alberta students are environmentally literate and equipped with the knowledge and skills to help create a sustainable future. So here's the outline for this morning's session. Um, we'll begin with myself and my colleague Kyle White, who will provide you with some foundational information around our local watershed and how it's being impacted by climate change. And then Laura Pacola from Inside Education will walk us through watershed management in Alberta and how you can explore watershed with your students. So like I said, there'll be two opportunities for Q&A, and we encourage you to put your questions in the chat. Um, which you can access uh, usually from the bottom of your Zoom screen. And then, uh, you know, we'll bring up those um, questions during the five minute Q&A sessions. So we want to start by um, acknowledging that the city of Calgary is located on Treaty 7 territory, a traditional meeting grounds, gathering place and traveling route of the Blackfoot nations, including Siksika, Pikani and Kayanai, as well as the Sutina and Stony Nakoda First Nations and the Métis Region 3. We further acknowledge that the long history of Indigenous peoples is inextricably tied to this land and that a unique relationship exists between Indigenous peoples and the natural world. 
This relationship, which is based above all else on harmony with Mother Earth, has allowed the original inhabitants of these lands to survive and thrive for thousands of years prior to the arrival of the first Europeans. And as the Truth and Reconciliation Commission has recognized, reconciliation will never occur unless we're able to be reconciled with the Earth. So today we honor and acknowledge the knowledge keepers, scientists, artists, youth, and teachers like yourselves who seek to move us toward reconciliation, not only with our indigenous brothers and sisters, but also with our mother, the earth. And we'd like to acknowledge another reality that teachers are facing this year, COVID, and the many challenges and constraints teachers like you have to deal with because of it. We're mindful that you're dealing with a lot at the moment, and we want to express our deepest and heartfelt gratitude for your dedication to keeping our students engaged in learning. You are true heroes, and we're so happy to be here to support you in the important work that you guys do. So before we begin our presentations, it'd be great to get a sense of who's with us. So um, it looks like we don't have too many people on the line, so this should be easy enough. So if you could uh, please introduce yourself in the chat. Um, you can put your name if you want, um, what school you teach at, and which grades and subjects you teach is what we're uh, really interested in here. I'm just gonna have to make my screen bigger for a minute here to see the chat, here we go. Okay, I can see now. So we've got, uh, okay, so it looks like we've got grade eight and nine science in French immersion. Okay, nice, at Branton School. Um, we've got Robert Thirsk teaching general science and biology, excellent. And uh, grade nine humanities, uh, Louis Riel. Okay. Um, and grade nine science. Okay, so lots of around grade eight, grade nine and uh, kind of science humanities, that's perfect. That's uh, the perfect audience for what we're looking for, I think, for this. And OK. Um, OK, so what I'm going to do now is uh, I think that's the yep, that's the end of my um, intro session here. So I'm just going to see if I can exit this and pull up the presentation and uh, we can kick it off. So maybe, um, can I just get a thumbs up from uh, Kyle if you can see the presentation? Awesome, thanks Kyle. Okay, so as I mentioned, uh, we're gonna kick off this session by providing an overview of how climate change is impacting Calgary's watersheds. So we know that climate change is already shifting and amplifying precipitation patterns in Calgary and that those changes will become more dramatic in future decades. So Kyle and I are gonna talk about what these changes uh, mean for Calgarians, how the city is working to address some of these challenges and how you and your students can kind of, uh, you know, link to the city's action and get involved in the solution. So let's first take a look at the projections for the cause of climate change, global greenhouse gas emissions, and the associated projected temperature increases. So in 2015 at the Paris Climate Conference, many countries around the world agreed upon greenhouse gas reduction targets and actions to try to limit the degree of global warming. And the red line in this graph shows the projected global temperature increase by the year 2100, so in the next 80 years, if these countries didn't carry out any of their agreed upon actions. So we'd see about you know, four and a half degrees Celsius average annual temperature increase. The black line in the middle here represents our temperature projection if all countries do carry out their agreed upon actions um, per the, the Paris Accord. So as you can see, even if all the countries acted upon all of their agreed upon actions, we're st still likely to experience an average global temperature increase of about three and a half degrees Celsius by the year 2100, according to widely accepted projections. So right now, just as an FYI, uh, globally, we're trending somewhere just below this red line. So what this tells us is that the climate is inevitably changing and there will inevitably be impacts associated with this change. So what climate changes can we expect in Calgary from global climate change? 
Well, the city has completed several studies to understand the major climate related changes expected in Calgary over the next 30 to 60 years. So in the future, Calgary summers will become hotter and drier. So for example, right now, our daily maximum temperatures in the summer are somewhere around 21 degrees Celsius. Climate projections show that by the 2080s, so in the next 60 years, our daily maximum temperatures will be closer to 28 degrees Celsius. So about seven degrees Celsius hotter um, for our daily maximum temperatures. Right now, we see about six really hot days per year, and we consider a really hot day to be above 29 degrees Celsius. By 2080, we're likely to see as many as 49 of these really hot days. So, you know, potentially over 40 more really hot days than we experience now per year. Our hottest days will also be extremely hot compared to what Calgarians have experienced in the past, and our number of dry days will also increase in the summer. In the future, Calgary's winters will become warmer and wetter. So although average winter temperatures will still remain below zero by 2080, we'll have warmer temperatures overall in the winters and we'll experience less days below freezing. Winters in Canada are already warming more rapidly than any other season, and that trend will continue into future decades. In terms of precipitation in the winter, we'll see less total snowfall annually, uh, particularly less snowfall in the shoulder seasons, spring and fall, as rising temperatures shift snow events to rain events in those shoulder seasons. However, we are still likely to experience heavy dumps of snow in the core winter months. And then finally, Calgary's springs and autumns will also become warmer and wetter. So in the spring, warmer temperatures with more rain falling on snow means that snow will melt earlier and faster in the year. And in the autumn, we'll experience more rain rather than snow, um, but warmer temperatures will sort of delay the first snowfall. So that's just kind of an overview for you guys of um, what we're anticipating to experience in terms of changes to Calgary's climate variables because of the influence of climate change. So these projected changes in temperature and precipitation mean more than just shorter winters and balmier days. Using climate models, scientists are able to predict how those shifting temperatures and precipitation patterns will make climate related hazards more likely and more severe. So this slide shows Calgary's key climate hazards that are being amplified because of increased greenhouse gas emissions in our atmosphere. So as I walk you through these hazards, I want you to think about um, you know, how these hazards might impact the watershed surrounding Calgary, because that's really what this session is about, right? Um, so I invite you to write your ideas about how these um, climate hazards um, yeah, might influence or change or impact Calgary's watershed. Uh, you can write it in the comments. So extreme heat, first of all, um, we know that, you know, days are getting, we're going to be experiencing more heat waves, um, hotter temperatures, et cetera, because of climate change. So how might extreme heat impact our watershed? Well, more extremely hot days can cause changes to both water quality and impact living conditions for aquatic life. Um, we'll have a higher chance of wildfires and wildfire smoke in the city. And we know more wildfires can cause changes to water quality from buildup of ash, soil erosion and fire debris, as an example. Um, research shows that climate change is causing an increase in convective storms or what we call damaging storms. So that's like thunderstorms, hail, high wind events and intense precipitation. Um, because warmer air holds more moisture, climate change is leading to more extreme amounts of rainfall falling in short bursts of high energy storms, often followed by little or no rain between heavy downpours. Likewise, we'll increasingly see greater amounts of snow falling in single dumps during the core winter months. Um, and there's also potential for more freezing rain and rain on snow events. So how can both heavy winter and summer storms affect the watershed? Well, for one, they can cause more stormwater runoff, which impacts water quality, and they can also lead to sudden increases in water quantity, leading to flooding. Shifting seasons, we consider a climate hazard. Um, this refers to changes in seasonality. So for example, spring arriving earlier and summer lasting longer. 
So how might this impact the watershed? Well, longer, drier summers lead to lower water quality and quantity near the end of the summer. And changes in seasonality can also cause a misalignment between the seasons and the life cycles of aquatic life. So for example, fish hatching, mating, or migrating before they typically would. And the last two hazards that are being amplified by climate change are flooding, so overland and river flooding, and drought. So I'm gonna hand it over to Kyle now to give us a bit more detail about these last two hazards, since they have an obvious and direct impact on our watershed. So he'll discuss with you what the city is doing around these hazards and some things you can do with your students. So uh, I'll pass it over to Kyle. Thanks, Caitlin. You can advance to the next slide. All right, welcome everyone. So understanding Calgary's watershed really is a key starting point to understanding how we're impacted by it. So let's take a closer look at Calgary. We all know that we live in the Bow and Elbow River watersheds, but do your students know which sub-watershed they live in. There are six subwatersheds in Calgary. Nose Creek, Bow River Direct, the Shepherd Wetland and Western Irrigation District, and the Elbow and Fish Creek watersheds. And any water that falls in one of these watersheds will flow to the same point. So that's sort of how we define a particular watershed. Next slide, please. Now, as Caitlin mentioned, climate change is amplifying the risk of drought-like conditions. This is because of earlier timing of snowmelt in the spring and really the higher chance of longer, drier, and as mentioned, hotter summers. For our watershed, this really means a decrease in river flow volumes in the summer months, especially as we get into the later summer uh, and glacier and glacier snowpacks are depleted. It also results in a decrease in river water quality. In particular, this will show up as that decline in spring flows due to a smaller snowpack. And your students may likely experience reduced those late summer flows by mid-century due to glacier loss. Next slide, please. Uh, yeah, if you can click a couple of times, that'd be great. Now this, what can, what can citizens do? And now this is not about convincing students to change familial behavior, but we're really focusing on building an understanding about how decisions at a personal scale are linked to the larger watershed. So one of the first things that citizens can do is install a rain barrel. So not only do rain barrels capture free water and reduce runoff and loading on the stormwater system, but they're a great visual reminder for establishing habits around water conservation and actually visualizing how much how much water you're using. A second technique for hardening your yard or preparing it for a changing climate is reducing the amount of lawn that you have. So there are certain, you know, there's drought tolerant species such as water wise annuals, perennials, ground covers and grasses and you can, and you can get the whole list of them at calgary.ca slash yardsmart. Um, but these are not only drought tolerant, but they really act as filters to capture runoff, minimizing stormwater impacts from water leaving property and really improving the quality of our, of our river water. Another simple action that can be taken is using mulch. So mulch and compost are really great for reducing moisture loss from soils. Uh, the city does give away free mulch and compost that are from the green cart program. And so if anyone is interested in that, uh, dates will be available in late spring. And I uh, just call 311 probably sometime in March or check our website to find the actual dates. And while these actions will really toughen everyone's yards for surviving a drought, in the event that a serious drought occurs, there may be additional and more immediate actions required such as reducing overall watering levels, watering in the morning or evening, and using tools so you can water right close to the roots, sort of as, as is shown in the, in the image here. Next slide, please. Now, I ought to say that we're gonna go from drought to flooding, but the two of them are actually also both related to, to climate change. Because climate change is also exacerbating the conditions that lead to river and overland flooding, making the chance of major flooding in Calgary even more likely. 
for example, hotter temperatures and heavier snow, heavier rainfall can trigger more rain on snow events with warm rains landing on a snowpack, such as what happened in 2013. And there are indications that there will be more stalled precipitation events, those long duration storms that get stuck for a few days. Uh, this has been happening here as well as across the continent on an increasingly frequent basis. And there are atmospheric drivers that are leading to this. Also, the timing will change. The spring freshet or runoff may be up to 36 days earlier in the mountains. The snow melt flows as early as late March, early April, April versus the current timing of May and into June. That could be expected. Next slide, please. So what's the city doing? The city has developed a flood resilience plan that addresses flood impacts at a watershed scale, a community scale, and an individual property scale. Watershed level work really includes the upstream flood protection on the Bow and Elbow rivers to increase water storage capacity and help slow larger flows from the mountains. And this is largely managed at the provincial level. And you'll, you'll hear media uh, discussion about some of these larger infrastructure projects. At the community level, we're looking at flood protection through the installation and upgrading of permanent infrastructure in Calgary. So upgrades to Glenmore Dam, flood, flood berms and barriers, things like that. At a property level protection, this is done through changes to building regulations and bylaws, limiting the types of development in flood prone areas and flood education and individual actions that, that citizens can take to, to protect their own properties. Next slide, please. So some of the community scale protection that I wanted to highlight. Has anyone noticed the recent construction work that's been going on in the Glenmore Dam? It's just wrapped up in the last few months, but it's been ongoing for the last couple of years. So with the new improvements to the dam that were completed in time for the spring 2020 flood season, the Glenmore Reservoir can now hold double the volume of water that it used to. Now, so now Glenmore can hold back more water during moderate flood events, such as if anyone can remember the flooding we had in 2005, that's sort of the level of flooding that Glenmore can hold back now. But the new steel gate system that's been installed will provide greater flexibility to manage the reservoir storage by storing higher levels of water in the winter. So during lower flow levels, we can store, store more water. So these improvements actually help us for both dry and wet conditions. So it's kind of a perfect example of a, a climate change mitigation strategy that the city has, has invested in. Now, as a bonus, the new bridge deck provides better access for pedestrians and cyclists to use the and connect, reconnect the pathway system. Next slide, please. So what else is the city doing to, to, help, uh, to help protect? We're also working on projects to better protect and manage natural features in our city, like trees, wetlands, and parks. And these natural assets help to prevent stormwater runoff and flooding by absorbing water as they reduce erosion during flood events. In addition, they keep the city cooler by reducing the, the heat island effect and they can store carbon dioxide. So we do some bioengineering and in terms of trying to contain stormwater as it hits the, hits the river. And uh, there's been quite a bit of work that's been done in this area. Next slide, please. Now, what can you do? There are things that everyone can do to be prepared. And, and even at a student level, it can include things like understanding evacuation plans and what this might look like from a home or school setting if relevant. So has your family discussed where they would meet? Um, at a household level, it's things like preparing, moving um, precious objects or sentimental objects from the lower levels of your property, uh, checking downspouts. If you have a sump, pump, making sure that it's operational and it has a, that it has a backup power supply. So then the event the power is turned off, the sump pump can still operate. So for more information, there's a whole, um, whole document at calgary.ca slash flood, where a lot of information is provided on the city's flood preparation.
Next, please. And we just wanted to highlight an opportunity to engage your class in uh, in taking some action. And so there is a an opportunity to win prizes and get some some grants toward taking action at the school level. So for for more information on this, please go to caringforourwatersheds.com, and you can find out the deadlines. Uh, proposal deadline is March 21st. And uh, yeah, if there's any questions, please uh, please put them up in the in the chat. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, thanks a lot, Kyle. Um, yeah, so so thanks everyone. That was just like a very quick overview of you know how climate change is impacting our watersheds in Calgary. A little bit about what the city is doing about it, and um, some connections that you can make with your students. Um, if anyone has questions, we have a little bit of time right now to do a Q and A. Um, and okay, I see a first question here from Jocelyn. Is it possible to get a copy of this presentation? Yes, absolutely it is. And what we'll do is at the end of this uh, whole uh, session at 10, we'll um, give you guys a link um, in the chat. You can go to that link, fill out, a, I think, just a little bit of your information. And, um, and we'll give you these PowerPoint presentations, um, you know, and with uh, some links and resources and that sort of thing. So yes. We, we can give you this presentation. Yeah. Um, any other questions before we switch over to Laura from Inside Education? Um, OK, yeah, and Leah um, from ACE just said, if you do have to leave this session early, she can post the link for you. Um, just let her know. So um, with that, I guess uh, if you do think of questions, feel free to post them in the chat at any time. But um, with that, I'm going to stop sharing and we'll hand it over to Laura Pacola with Inside Education to walk us through um, a little bit more of an Alberta wide perspective of our watersheds and some activities you can do with your class. So I'll hand it over, Laura. Wonderful. Thank you, Caitlin. I'm just going to get myself ready and share my screen here. Um, there we go. So uh, good morning, everyone. It's really great to see uh, see you trickling in. I saw in the comments there that there was some some issues on the on the convention website, but glad you have made it. Um, so as as Caitlin said, my name is Laura Pacola, and uh, I work for Inside Education. So I'll be talking a little bit more about like the broader scale of watersheds and how some of that information that Caitlin and Kyle just shared can actually apply to um, the watershed environments and uh, us as stakeholders in the watershed as well. So uh, we're really going to focus on some of those relationships that people have with the with the watershed, and um, I always find that a really interesting way to bring in Indigenous perspectives and knowledge into uh, these presentations as well, because many of the Indigenous groups of uh, this area of North America, for sure, have a worldview that looks at the land as something that um, they borrow from. So they're borrowing from others, whether it be other humans or other living things or also the abiotic uh, parts of the environment too. So anytime they're using anything from the environment, they're borrowing from it. And they're also borrowing from future generations. So at Inside Education, we really like to have that conversation about how we can take care of the environment and how we can be uh, stewards of the environment. And I think that links really, really well. So uh, that's an idea that we can keep in the back of our mind as we go through uh, some of these slides here and also something that you can bring to your classroom as well and see if you can uh, figure out a way of uh, of having that conversation with your students too. Oh, I see my the sun is starting to shine in my window here so I apologize for a little sunburst there but um, I also want to uh, thank the Alberta Water Portal Society and Land Stewardship Centre for making it possible for us to have this uh, this presentation today and um, we are going to be using something called Mentimeter. I don't know if you're familiar with it or not, but um, there is, uh, you can actually scan that QR code or you can go to menti.com, put in that um, code or just click on the link that I just put into the chat. And we're gonna use this as kind of a interactive way of uh, 
gathering some information and, and thoughts from you. So the first question that's already up is what words come to mind when you think of watersheds? So I'll let you kind of put the, those uh, thoughts into Mentimeter and it will actually start creating a word cloud for us, which will be kind of uh, interesting to see your thoughts combined with everyone else's. So feel free to do that here as I, as I kind of uh, continue talking about, um, about who we are. So um, as we go through this, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. And then um, at the end, I will definitely check the chat. I'll do my best to do it as we go as well. And then um, I, we do have a PDF of this presentation uh, with links to just about everything we referenced. So uh, that will be made available too. Okay, so watersheds are connected. Sustainability, I like that. Rivers, that's a pretty, uh, pretty big one. Rivers are at the center of every watershed for sure glaciers, responsibility. So I can see even from, uh, even at this point, watersheds aren't just about the physical features in the environment. It's a lot about the humans and our interactions with it as well and how we interact with it. So I'm really happy to see uh, that, that uh, we're all kind of on the same page. So I'll leave that up for now. Um, actually, I'm gonna flip to the next one. So what units do watershed conversations already come up in uh, for you? So I'm gonna actually leave that up, but I'm gonna go back to the presentation and just talk a little bit about who we are, and then I'll revisit that in just a couple minutes. So put in your ideas of what units you already talk about watersheds in. So at Inside Education, uh, we are a natural resource and environmental education charity. We've been around for 35 years now, and uh, we provide Alberta-specific information to um, to teachers and students in the K-12 school system. So we, our values are there on the screen and we really believe it's essential to consider all the perspectives that are uh, associated with any natural resource issue uh, because it's never a black and white, uh, there's like one person versus another kind of issue. It's always lots of people wanting natural resources for lots of different reasons and, and considering that is super important. We also feel that uh, the firsthand experiences are the most important, of course, this year, a little bit challenging, not being able to take students uh, as many places as we're used to, but uh, we've worked really hard at even creating uh, experiences out of our virtual uh, programs as well. And of course, critical thinking, I don't think I need to talk too much about that to uh, a Zoom room full of teachers, but um, truly allowing students to uh, take facts and then take those facts um, within themselves and come to their own decisions is the best way for students to learn about topics. So um, we try and do those experiential um, experiential learning through like field trips and classroom programs, but I'll talk a little bit more about all of our programs at the end. So you are all obviously um, uh, uh, teachers and a diverse set of teachers with uh, different skills and interests and experiences as well. Uh, for those that came a little bit late, feel free to introduce yourself in the chat just with uh, what you teach and at what school. Um, so far, we had a lot of grade kind of nine, eight, nine age, um, and, and we are focusing on the junior and senior high kind of curriculum here as we go through. So uh, we're all being stretched to come up with like new and innovative ways to work together and bring learning to life. So we're really, really happy to be able to talk about this with you. And also as I go through, I'm gonna be talking about some of the curriculum connections that we at Inside Education have come up, to, come up with, but you are all the curriculum experts. So if you think of ways that you could use some of the activities that I'm talking about, feel free to put it in the chat because maybe someone else can make use of that information too. Like this session is totally for you as teachers. So make the most of it, interact as much as you want in the chat. And uh, I'll do my best to catch up at the end if there are any questions in there. All right. So the stewardship piece already mentioned, our main goal at Inside Education is to support teachers and inspire students to become lifetime stewards in, uh, in environmental topics here in Alberta. So the more connected we feel with our environment, the more likely we are to take care of it. So that connection piece is really good to chat about with our, uh, with our students for that reason. Okay, so let's go back to, so has anyone, uh, oh, there's so many. So environmental chemistry is a big one for where watershed topics already come in. Um, CTS as well, bio 20, Science 10, fresh and saltwater systems, 
Awesome. So there are various um, like science and, and CTS units that we do talk about watersheds. And uh, I'm curious if there are any non-science teachers here who see any links to maybe social or, uh, well, yeah, especially social units too. So as a little pop quiz uh, before we get into the watershed piece, um, who knows where the Bow River ends up draining to? So you can pick your answer there and then uh, I'll actually go into what the what the watersheds of Alberta look like. Does it go to the Arctic Ocean, Hudson's Bay, Gulf of Mexico? Okay, lots of people saying Hudson's Bay. And I'll leave you on a cliffhanger here for a minute until I get to the right map and then we will, I'll show it to you. So um, I'm gonna just be going through um, Alberta's watersheds um, water quality and climate change, so kind of or, um, building off of what Caitlin and uh, Kyle talked about already, and then we're really focusing on the Bow River watershed and then the stakeholders that we have here as well. So one of the ways I love uh, starting uh, water presentations with our grade eight classes is I love asking who here has been to a watershed, and it's amazing how many students uh, or how many classes will have no one put up their hand. So uh, a lot of students don't even understand what a watershed is until they actually uh, see the map and, and start understanding it. So many are blown away when it is all of us. So Alberta has uh, seven major watersheds and um, they actually drain to three different oceans, um, which were in the quiz there. So that was kind of a hint. And um, I really like this map, even though it's a little bit Poor quality as an image, but the light blue around each river actually shows the volume of water that that um, that that river. Holy moly, the sun is crazy here. So uh, the it shows the volume of water that that river carries. So you'll notice that the rivers in the north carry the most water uh, compared to those in the south. But then if you think about population, it's actually kind of flipped. The south has the most population. So uh, water quantity or the amount of water is definitely something that we need to consider here in the Bow River. So if we look at where our watersheds actually drain to, uh, the northern ones go up to the Arctic Ocean. So it goes through the territories to the Arctic Ocean. And then those of you who said Hudson's Bay for us here in the Bow, which is part of the South Saskatchewan River Basin, uh, you are absolutely correct. But go a little further south and the Milk River Basin actually does uh, go all the way through the states to the Gulf of Mexico. So uh, pretty, pretty long distances that water does have to travel. And that's one of the things that we want to keep in mind too, is that watersheds aren't just right here in Calgary or even right here in Alberta, we have to consider the entire watershed and all the connections along the way. So anything that we do to the water um, here in, in Calgary is, is also going to impact everyone downstream too. So those are important conversations to have with our students as well, just that watersheds um, carry everything along uh, long, long distances. So the impacts can be pretty wide ranging. So here is a map of the Bow River Basin, which shows the sub watersheds, which uh, Kyle mentioned as well. Um, so within the whole Bow River Basin, there are uh, quite a few of these sub basins. So we start up, the river starts up in the Rocky Mountains, uh, flows into Bow Lake, which is the start of the actual Bow River. And then it joins the Old Man River in the grasslands region to merge and become the South Saskatchewan um, River. Um, which then continues on east. So um, because watersheds are so complex, watershed organizations use uh, state of the watershed indicators to measure the health and function of the watershed. And uh, this map is actually from the Bow River Basin Council website, uh, and I'll link that to this presentation as well. They have a really nice like story map of the different indicators and state of the watershed, which was um, a really nice way to see all the information. So um, in general, uh, water quality is kind of the health of the water. So uh, we can look at three main characteristics when we look at uh, water quality. So there is quantity, so how much water there is. So we, we know that climate change is going to impact that with um, flood events as well as, um, as, well as um, the drought uh, in general that we're going to be seeing. 
Um, then there's point source pollution. So those are the things where we can see end of pipe exactly where the pollution is coming from. And then non-point sources, which are from the environment at large, but we can't necessarily see where, um, where exactly the pollution is coming from. So examples of that might be something like agriculture or even forestry or even cities, because when uh, the salt or anything, any chemicals that are on roads, when they wash into the um, into the environment, you can't really pinpoint exactly where they came from. So that can be further broken down to the physical and chemical contaminants. Uh, so physical contaminants are things like sediments. So yes, they are natural, they exist in the watershed, but when we have lots of sediments uh, eroding into the river, it changes the environment uh, for aquatic uh, animals. And uh, that can be, and it can actually also change the way that rivers flow depending on where the sediments build up. So that's an important thing to monitor too. And then chemical contaminants, things like fertilizers or uh, pesticides from agriculture, um, anything coming off of roads, including road salt in the winter. Uh, so those are also important to look at. And then finally, there's the biological contaminants, which are the things that are not so nice to think about, but important to consider. So things like our blue green algae, uh, E. coli, also swimmer's itch, which is actually a parasite that tries to burrow into our skin because it thinks we're a duck. And then once it realizes we're not a duck, it leaves us alone, but it does leave us a jeep, which is very annoying. And then um, invasive species as well. So those are kind of the main ways that uh, watersheds can be affected. And when we look at the Bow River Basin and their state of the water watershed report, uh, you can see all the indicators that they use kind of around the outside. So water quantity, they look at how much water flows through the different monitoring stations that they have. And then they also look at uh, the dissolved phosphorus algae, water temperature, E. coli, dissolved oxygen, total suspended solids, and nitrates as well. Um, so those can come from various sources, but um, for anyone with any familiarity with, uh, with agricultural products, nitrates and phosphorus uh, are definitely big ones that uh, are, are, part of, are part of those. So that might be one of the places that it comes from too. So uh, by measuring these different indicators, they're able to keep track of what the state of the watershed is right now and then compare in the future too. So with the water quantity, one of the really interesting things is that 80% of Bow River water or the Bow River watershed water actually comes from snow melt in the mountains and on the prairies. So glaciers are definitely important, but it's not the main place where Bow River gets its water flow. So now if we're going to see warmer winters with maybe less snowpack or um, and earlier melt times in the, in the spring, that's going to impact how much water is going down the bow um, in the drier months of the summer. So uh, that's one of the challenges that the Bow River is going to face with climate change for sure. So that is one of the big things with climate change, but also uh, Calgary is a highly populated area. So there's a lot of draw on the water resource due to agriculture as well as the, the cities as well. So with the information that we heard from uh, Kyle and Caitlin earlier, we can start to think about how a changing climate in our area is going to have a certain effects, but then um, but then increased human pressures are also going to have other effects too. So uh, they can actually accumulate on each other uh, and, and cause issues that are bigger than just the one plus one and, um, and, and create issues in the Bow River. So we're actually going to take a look at three different case studies that look specifically at Bow River watershed. And um, these are maybe some case studies that uh, you might be able to take a look at with your students and can and can prompt similar conversations really in any watershed in Alberta as well. So uh, the first one we're going to look at is native trout. And with each of these case studies, we've uh, tried to incorporate either a resource or an activity that you can do with your students too. So uh, on the screen now, you see Alberta's native trout uh, poster, which is one of our species at risk posters that Inside Education has developed. We also have a woodland caribou one as well. And these posters really take a look at the species biology, uh, threats that they are facing, restoration work that is being done, as well as um, careers in that area too. So um, 
there are various uh, there are various trout species in the province, but um, the Athabasca rainbow trout is one of the uh, or rainbow trout in general are one of the species at risk. So, what kind of threats do you think species at risk, such as uh, Alberta's native trout, might face? You can put those into the um, chat. So, in general, what threats could you see? Something like a rainbow trout facing in the Bow River in uh, in Alberta. Temperature change, definitely. That's a really good one because trout need quite cool waters in order to survive. And uh, with the increasing temperatures, especially in the summer, a lot of our rivers might end up a lot warmer, especially if they get shallower, they're gonna end up warmer and not be the appropriate um, habitat for trout. Also warmer water holds less oxygen, so less oxygen for the trout, definitely. Uh, sediment from the construction recreation industry, so the more people that there are on the landscape, that's going to make a difference too. Oh, the shifting seasons for sure. So uh, with their, um, with uh, the availability of different insects and their prey, and then the right temperatures for when they spawn, that's going to all uh, impact it as well. So those are definitely really good ones. And uh, also human activity on the landscape in general with like more, yes, man-made activity, perfect. Uh, more roads, which means that there's more access and more sedimentation into the rivers and watersheds as well. One of the other big things is the introduction of non-native species. So in Alberta, um, in the 1950s and 60s, there were actually some introductions of, um, of non-native trout species into uh, Banff. And um, I'll actually talk about that in a bit, but uh, that actually causes an issue as well. So uh, talking about the challenges is definitely important. And it's important to really focus on those challenges with our students, but focusing on the personal actions that uh, they can take to make a difference or even addressing the restoration acti activities that are in place um, can help bring about that conversation of hope. So it's not just like, oh man, our trout are dying and they're doomed, but there are things that are being done and there's a lot of technology going into this, um, into trout research and uh, it, it is, pretty hopeful. So uh, there are solutions um, such as, well, this one that might seem a little bit bizarre, but um, Parks Canada is actually getting rid of all the invasive species in a couple of Banff lakes uh, so that that um, that habitat can be restored to the, the native trout. So uh, the chemical that's being used is called rotenone and uh, they have actually used that in a couple of the lakes to kill off all the non invasive or all the invasive um, trout species that are there. And then once it's all cleared of the fish, then we can reintroduce the species that we want there. And it's almost like resetting the ecosystem. So uh, it, what, the interesting thing here is when you read a, a headline like Parks Canada kills fish in remote band flanks to protect at-risk native species, that instills a lot of uh, different emotions because when we hear about killing uh, specific animals, we it doesn't usually make us feel very good, right? So it's an interesting conversation around media literacy to have with our students too. So uh, lots of interesting stuff going on just with our uh, native trout species. So now we're gonna move into the city and look at goldfish and storm ponds. So goldfish are actually a really big issue uh, across Alberta and um, huge amounts of them have been found in, I think it's up to 75 locations across Alberta have had uh, goldfish in natural water systems. So this image is of some goldfish from uh, Fort McMurray, but uh, similar things are happening in Calgary and Okotoks too. And uh, these goldfish, so they can actually get to be the size of like a dinner plate. The crazy thing is that uh, when we have them in our fish tanks, they seem quite small and don't really seem to be much of a threat. And you figure, well, I don't want this fish anymore. I'll just dump it in the storm pond out back and it'll just die off next winter. Not the case. Uh, goldfish are incredibly good at competing with uh, other species. So, um, so they actually can grow, they overwinter, they're really good at laying eggs, but they can also change the habitat then uh, for native species that might be there. 
Now in a storm pond, not that big of a deal, but with those flood events that we were talking about with uh, changes to, to the climate, uh, that's gonna cause more of our stormwater ponds to uh, overflow and then uh, flow into our river systems. So stormwater ponds are meant to kind of capture that extra rainfall during during flood events or like during high rainfall events. And it allows for uh, sediments and chemicals to filter out uh, slowly, which is good. And then um, they are meant to overflow into the river when they get too full. Uh, the problem is when we have introduced species into those stormwater ponds, uh, that's not so helpful. And then they can end up in our river systems too. So we need to be very aware of what we put into our storm ponds. And, um, and that is uh, uh, in Alberta or in Edmonton, which is where I live, we actually have the, um, our storm drains connect directly to the river systems as well. So you've maybe heard of the Yellowfish Road programs um, that look at or that remind people not to put things down the drain because that's going to just end up in our in our rivers and watersheds too. So humans are uh, inadvertently introducing goldfish sometimes into our environment as well. Now, great, we know that, and we know that we can use rotenone uh, to kill off these goldfish to get them out of the uh, ponds. But how do we know which ponds actually have uh, these fish in them? It's pretty. Uh, it's a very high intensity um, project to have to fish each lake to see if you catch goldfish or not. But there are other ways that we can actually see whether there are goldfish in these ponds. And uh, it's actually using DNA. So we can use environmental DNA from water samples to see what living things actually exist in those water bodies. And Inside Education is working with University of Alberta on a citizen science program that is going to monitor storm ponds uh, in different communities across the province for various biological entities. Uh, we don't get to choose what things are monitored, but it might be things like uh, the parasites that cause swimmers itch, or maybe it's the invasive goldfish. It really depends on what the University of Alberta happens to be looking at at that moment. So um, we can do this by using a machine called a qPCR, which is quantitative, quantitative polymerase chain reaction machines, where we can take water samples, do a few different steps to them, and then we can process them to see if uh, various biological entities are present. So um, I'll just walk you through how the environmental DNA uh, monitoring process works, and then um, and then we can see, and then I'll tell you a little bit more about that project. So our water sample can have living things in it, um, and which are these little squigglies in, in that circle. And inside of each of the little organisms, you can see this different DNA. Now, some DNA is uh, shared between living organisms, uh, but then there are segments uh, within each species that is completely unique. So the one that's highlighted yellow is the one we're gonna focus on. And you can see that it's the only one with that light green da dash and dot DNA uh, code. So that's what makes it unique. Say it's a goldfish. So what we can do is we can take a sample of water and it's just the cells of the goldfish that need to be present in the water. And as long as they're there, then we can go through this process uh, to, to identify whether it's there or not. So uh, we can actually use different solvents to break the cells open and release the DNA. We can also, we have solvents that then take out the proteins and the fats as well. So it's just kind of a DNA soup in the end. And then when we put it through the qPCR machine, it actually amplifies the DNA. So it looks for those tags um, of, of the DNA sequence, which is where the star is. And once it reaches that tag, it will replicate whatever is after it. And then we can get uh, the amount of DNA in our in our sample amplified. Those of you who teach uh, high school biology could probably explain this much better than I, but anyway, just get a general idea. So then after we go through this, after the qPCR machine goes through this process uh, multiple times, we have enough of the DNA in the sample that we could then uh, see, well, then we can measure how much is, is present. So the thing is that for each of these uh, samples that we run, we only run it for to look for a specific thing. So in this case, we might be looking for goldfish. If it's present, then our little goldfish line will go up above that red threshold line. And if goldfish isn't present, then um, 
then it will stay below that red line too. So it's a really cool way to see what environment or what biological organisms are present in the water versus um, in a very simple and, and less time intensive way. So we like to do this. We can actually come to your class when we're allowed in classrooms again to uh, do this with your students with water samples gathered from around your school. And uh, eventually we hope to actually be giving, I believe it's up to 20 of these QPCR machines to specific schools who commit to doing this for um, a extended period of time. And uh, then you can get involved in community-based monitoring, which is pretty cool. Uh, just a heads up, Laura, we're going to have to transition to the wrap up pretty soon. Sounds good. So I'll just go through some of the things. So we also do other online presentations uh, with um, various topics. So you can go to our website to find out about those. And a lot of our, uh, we won't go through this case study, but we do have this running water poster, which looks at the watershed around say Calgary. And you can actually look at the different stakeholders that are there, um, how those stakeholders might be impacting the water and then have conversations about um, climate change and those stake stakeholder impacts as well. And then again, having that uh, conversation about how to improve water quality based on the actions of those stakeholders. And virtual field trip to our website. We have lots of activities there that we developed uh, through COVID here. Um, Follow the flow is a really good water one. So it's looking at stakeholders, who uses water and how, and what that all means. And uh, we have an energy grant, A plus for energy. Uh, if you have an energy project that you are interested in, uh, definitely worth signing up for. You can win up to $5,000. And some teacher PD is coming up. Um, I can send you more information about this. Uh, afterwards. And here are wonderful other organizations that have really cool resources too. Thank you. And sorry about uh, taking up a little bit more than my own time. And if you do want any of this information from Inside Education, you can actually fill in the survey, which, oops, which I will put in the chat and then I will get in touch with you. Yeah, sounds good. Thanks so much, Laura. That was an awesome presentation. Um, yeah, and I'll just remind everyone that like this PowerPoint presentation will also be shared with everyone. Um, so I'll just uh, take the screen back here and we have a, just a little bit of a five minute wrap up um, and I'm going to just talk about some additional resources for teachers. Um, so to help teachers see connections between their curriculum and the envir and environmental and sustainability um, links, the Alberta Council for Environmental Education has identified links between each unit of the science and social studies curriculum to four sustainability themes, which you can see here on the screen. So links to place in nature, links to indigenous perspectives, links to climate change, and links to City of Calgary environmental and climate strategies. So um, here's an example for the grade eight uh, science unit on freshwater and saltwater um, systems. So all of these links are available on the Alberta Council for Environmental Education website by grade and subject. And um, the ULR is provided on the slide here, which we'll share with you guys as long as you sort of fill out the survey at the end. Um, so yeah, feel free to go to the ACE website and check out these uh, curriculum links. They're currently, ACE is currently working on curriculum links to these uh, topics for grade 10 to 12. We also want to bring to your uh, to your attention the connections to the Eco Schools Canada program, which is now excitingly available to Calgary schools. Um, prior to this year, it was only available in uh, Eastern Canada. So Eco Schools is an environmental certification program for schools that features an extensive library of over 40 eco actions, several of which support learning and action around water management. So you can see these featured on the left hand side of the slide. Uh, each eco action comes with its own action guide, so it makes it really easy for teachers to get started uh, with your students at your school, whether it's your class or, you know, an environmental club or some, something like that. Schools earn points by completing actions of their choice, working toward a bronze, silver, gold or platinum level of certification. The Alberta Council for Environmental Education has also worked with our local environmental education community to identify local resources to support each of these 40 available eco actions. So if you want to take, you know, this action, the Great Gulf, you might be able to, um, you know, get linked up with local, um, you know, um, people or 
organizations like Inside Education, for example, from our local community that can help support that action. So to learn more, visit the Eco Schools Canada in Calgary website, which is linked here. Um, and you'll, like I said, you'll get this link. A quick reminder that it's not too late to join other sessions that are part of the secondary stream of this environmental symposium. Um, there are three more sessions today for secondary teachers talking about the Eco Schools program that we're piloting in Calgary, exploring sustainability through an Indigenous lens, and climate action. So we've included a link to the, or I'll include this now actually, um, I'm putting a link to the symposium in the chat here um, if you guys haven't already and would like to sign up to, for some of these other sessions. So we'd like to extend a huge word of thanks to the funders who generously support um, the work that the Alberta Council for Environmental Education does to help teachers inf infuse more environmental education into their everyday teaching. Without their support, this work wouldn't be possible. So we really hope you've enjoyed this session. Um, if you'd like to follow up with any of us, we've provided our emails here. Um, I'm going to paste one more link in the chat, and this is the important one. Um, there we go. Um, so if you'd like to receive a copy of the presentations with the links to all these resources, you can go to the URL on this slide, um, sorry, the URL I pasted in the chat, and enter um, your contact information, and we'll then send you the links to all the information presented. So there's also an opportunity here to give us some feedback, and we thank you in advance for any feedback you provide so we can continue to improve these workshops. So thank you once again for joining us, and we hope you enjoy the rest of your convention. Um, have a great morning. Uh, I'll stay on at least for a couple minutes in case anyone has extra questions or uh, it looks like um, the convention people are working hard to try to get the technical difficulties smoothed out, but it might be a bit, a bit shaky still. Do you actually yeah. need to be signed in to uh, open a session? I can find the link to our session without signing in. That is that a, that's a question for the teachers, Leah? Yes. Yeah. Does anyone happen to know? I guess not. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, and I'm able to stay on for a couple more minutes here too, since we didn't have really a chance for a Q and A um, at, after Laura's presentation there. Um, in case anyone does have any questions. Okay, you have to be logged in to get the link. Mm. That's too bad. I'm That's trying too... out new, uh, new sites and new ways of doing things. That's too bad because that seems to be where the uh, where the choke point is is on the logins. Oh, I see. But I think they've got. You know, they've got a bunch of technical people working on it, so. Well, thanks a lot. This was uh, really, I think the session went awesome. So thanks Leah and Caitlin for, for making it run so smooth. And if Kyle's still here, no, oh, he's gone. But thank Kyle as well, Caitlin, when you next. Uh, yeah, I will. Yeah, and thank you, Laura. That was great. Yeah. Um, I do have an updated PDF if, possible to upload to the website. I know that's really annoying and we were supposed to have them last week for a reason. So if not, that's totally okay. The one that's there is, it still has probably 95% of the links. Um, um, uh, send it to us. Sure. I could probably get that up pretty okay, easily. Okay, sounds good. Uh, I'll no, just make a note. Yeah, no rush on that and I apologize and thank you for being so flexible. <laughs> never really stop thinking about a presentation until you're like giving it and it's like okay this is how I'm going to say it now <laughs> it's probably inevitable that there'll be a couple of these just because uh everyone's working really hard and wants to do the best they can do yeah awesome well I will also sign off and good luck with the rest of the symposium thank you okay yeah thanks a lot Laura we'll talk See to you, you later soon. okay bye-bye